we're going to open with a word of prayer this morning. This is uh, at Eagle River Grace. This is our pro-life Sunday. It could be next week or this week. And um, since our missionary moment of um, uh, is here, uh, uh, the Pregnancy Resource Center, we're going to do um, we're going to celebrate it sort of this Sunday. So uh, also our accompanists are recuperating or quarantining or working and so our opening hymn is actually going to be a pro-life video that I think is pretty sweet. So um, let's just uh, stand for a minute and Jeremy is going to open us with a word of prayer and then we'll move on from there. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, please be seated. And um, and are you going to run that in a session? So Zoomers, by the way, good morning, Zoomers. Good to have you with us as well. And uh, that'll be in a separate window for, for Zoom as well, so they can. All right. All right. You know, there's just something so truthful about a newborn baby, isn't there? I mean, I never thought of it in terms of truth, but I was just thinking there's just so much truth there. It's undeniable. Blessing from God. All right. Well, that was our opening hymn. Let's take a look at the bulletin quickly. Um, I guess I should say grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and see if there are any visitors Let's see any visitors who would like an introduction. In any case, fill out the tear-off if you're flying under the radar and would love to get in touch with you later in the week. All right, quick look at the bulletin. Aletheia and Icon, those are our young, uh, our teen men and women's groups, and they meet every other Tuesday. And I'm gathering this is one of those Tuesdays. Is that, is that uh, correct this week at 6.30 to 8.30? Um, okay, and if you have questions about that, Rebecca Jensen is the contact person for Alethea and Zach Williams for ICON. Moving on to Awana, we are continuing Awana. This Wednesday will be TNT night. So if you're a spark, you're not a spark, are you anymore? 
Well, anyway, uh, we had a great Sparks night last week, and we'll have a TNT night coming up this week, and then Cubbies will be uh, the week after. So, um, great. Kids are welcome to wear a mask. I noticed a lot of kids, oh, I want to wear a mask. I want. So we have a lot of Sparks running around with masks, um, but that's certainly not required. Adults and LITs are are masking up just for protection there. So, okay, Eagle River Grace business meeting is coming up on January 24th, and we will be um, uh, doing affirmation votes for some of our leadership, our deacons. And of course, the big item that we'll be looking at is the budget. Jeremy has been working very hard on the budget and has made all the numbers come out really well. We are blessed, people are generous and mature givers in this church and God has given us a lot to work with. So um, if you'd like to attend that, um, anyone is welcome to attend it. At certain points in the meeting, we take a vote and um, voting is for people who are confirmed official members of the church. And if you have a question about that, you can see uh, Brad. Um, but you're welcome to attend, especially if you're just trying to figure out, well, how does this church really do business and make decisions? It's a good time as well. Okay. Yes, Jeremy. Oh, sorry. The Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I asked you to remind me. So there is a copy of the proposed budget that will be voted upon in the back. Sarah's holding it up. It'll be on that table in the back. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Opportunity for baptism. We are open for baptism any Sunday of the, pretty much any Sunday of the, of the year. Um, and we just like to advertise that every once in a while and say, speak with new Pastor Brad about that. Okay. All right. And then learn to share the gospel. Uh, Mark and Sherilyn, are you here this morning? Okay, Mark, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Do you want to s speak to that yourself? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this coming Friday at the crossing uh, there in Shugiak, we are having a wordless book training for entire families. So it's not just for the teenagers. Um, our goal and our heart is to equip entire families to share the gospel together, to minister together. And so this Friday, we're, we're going to have one a month uh, for January, February, and March. Each night will be something different for the family um, but this this coming friday is learning to share the gospel um, i think when we have talked to to parents and um, even even pastors the biggest obstacle in sharing the gospel is well i'm not sure i know how or i don't feel confident and so we want to empower families and parents with that confidence um, to share the gospel with anybody, any place, any time. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. So that's this Friday, January 22nd, 6 to 8 p.m. at the crossing. And that announcement is in the bulletin. And you can probably contact Mark or Cheryl if you have more questions. All right. Any other uh, announcements that didn't make it in the bulletin and need to be brought up? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to move on to into our missionary moment. Um, our missionary moment this Sunday is for the pregnancy, the Heart to Heart Pregnancy Resource Center. And that's what all this table is about down here. This table is out in the foyer where people can, and we'll put it back out there. But sometimes we say, well, it's out in the foyer and out of sight, out of mind. So I just thought we'd bring it forward, especially on Pro-Life Sunday. So the report, Alicia is, is keeping her distance and not visiting churches right now. Um, so I'm just going to kind of read this report from uh, Jenny, who's also recovering from uh, some uh, foot surgery. So, um, so this is her take on it. The Heart to Heart Pregnancy Resource Center is managed by Alicia Thomas. Some of you, I'm sure, know her. She's been here before. Um, and it's a quiet gem in the midst in our midst for struggling families. It's a place of solace and provision for women throughout the region, but it's not just for women. Um, it also helps struggling young families, um, especially with um, in, in unplanned pregnancies, okay? So they have served this year 50 to 60 families materially, and I'm gonna come back to the materially in just a minute. Um, uh, she has counseled, Alicia has counseled about five to 10 people um, a month by phone. 
um, by Zoom, by appointment. Um, they are not open um, during regular hours right now, just complying with guidelines, but they, they will see people by appointment. Um, and kind of a fun thing, there's going to be kind of apparently a, a COVID baby boom um, <clears throat> starting about now. Um, but, you know, people spending a lot more time at home, I guess. But uh, she's, she's preparing for that. She's aware that she knows that it's several women who are, are, are their due dates are, are now or in the next couple months. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, considering clients who she actually has contact with who are considering abortion, she usually tries to get them to come into the center and meet with them personally, face-to-face. Um, and she knows of at least two women who are abortion-minded this year and called her back to say that they had changed their mind. So that's uh, pretty awesome. Okay, her goals for 2021, Alicia's, for the Pregnancy Resource Center are to reach as many people as possible with the love of Christ and to provide counsel and material aid. Um, her other big goal this year is to have an in-person fundraiser. They usually have a fundraiser here in Eagle River. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if I said this. If, if you're not aware, the Pregnancy Resource Center Heart to Heart is located here in Eagle River in that little um, mall where Mike's Meat is um, and kind of kitty corner to Walgreens. Um, so they usually have a fundraiser at Jitters with lots of food and items you know, to bid on and so forth. And they were not able to do that this year. So, um, so they have financial, uh, they're, they're needing more funds this year. Um, the table, which will be out there, this is a very cool table with uh, booklets and um, little babies that are, you're welcome to take one, that represent the, let me grab one. So these are the actual average size of a, uh, unborn child at the age of 12 weeks. So they have a beating heart by, somebody can remind me, but it's very, very, yeah, it's very early on and you can see how fully developed and beautiful little human they are. Um, we also have in this table, these baby bottles that we've had before. You're welcome to take these home and fill them with spare change. And when you, when it's filled, then you can either drop it off here at the church or just directly at the, um, uh, pregnancy Resource Center, although again, they, they aren't open a whole lot. You'd have to kind of call ahead to do that. Um, I had some fun. A um, couple, couple of days ago, I was like, well, just, you know, I just, she met me there and I wandered in and I said, well, well, you know, what kinds of things do they really have? Maybe you don't really know, but they have things like this, a onesie, and which says, the adventure begins. Um, I thought that was pretty cute. Um, of course, they provide diapers. These are always handy. These are cute little shoes. <laughs> New Balance. I mean, it's just, you know, you can, families walk in and they, they can have this stuff. Um, books. Uh, Peas and green beans and asparagus mush, my f favorite. Um, <laughs> but baby food. If it seems like I'm having a lot of fun with this, I, I am due to be a grandparent in about two months. So I'm getting excited about this stuff. And then, you know, this kind of stuff. I don't know if you can hear all this, but, uh, you know, <laughs> toys. So it's an amazing place, families that are struggling. Uh, financially can come in and get clothes and toys and diapers and baby food and stuff like that. So uh, we do support the Pregnancy Resource Center we have for many years as a church. And of course, you're welcome to um, support them uh, individually. Um, and you can do that by connecting with Alicia or, you know, uh, to make a direct donation or you can run that um, through the church. But I think probably we do have a other giving um, line item in the budget, and we'll probably be trying to help help them a little more with that. So if you'd like to, to help them financially, you're welcome to do it again through the church or directly. Okay, so that's our missionary moment, the heart to heart, 
Pregnancy Resource Center, which is managed by Alicia Thomas, and there's a board of a number of great people in the community who, um, who manage that as well. Anything I've left out? Any questions? All right. We're going to have Gabriel come up for the scripture reading. Please stand. The scripture reading for today is Matthew 3, 1 through 17. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees <coughs> coming from, for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can, come, can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. And the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, and said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Thank you, Gabriel. Good morning, Eagle River Grace. This is Matt Kirby uh, zooming in. Um, looks like I'm up on the screen. Can everybody hear me loud and clear? Yes, excellent. I'm getting head nods, outstanding. So uh, very odd that I'd be speaking to you today from my living room, or my bedroom, I guess. I uh, didn't think this would ever happen, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, we decided as an elder board, just because I have a little bit of a head cold, like obviously feeling mostly fine, but uh, just out of an abundance of caution, decided to be best not to come to church today and speak from home since we have the technology to do that. So that's what we're doing. So very rare do you get to speak to a group of people all over the city uh, from your bedroom, uh, but really uh, thankful for this opportunity. And, um, you know, I might or might not be wearing pajamas underneath this awesome stylist shirt. So, you know, uh, that's a benefit as well. All right, so let me open us up in a word of prayer, and then I will go ahead and pull the slideshow up and we'll get going, dive right in. Dear Lord, uh, thank you so much for this this morning that we can fellowship together. Thank you that we can fellowship uh, in the midst of a pandemic and in spite of um, you know, sickness and crazy things. We have the technology that allows us to still connect and be one with one another in fellowship before you. I pray that you'll uh, bless this message this morning, um, that you'll open our hearts and minds to hear and learn uh, what you have in store for us um, from your gospel. In your precious name, amen. All right, so as you heard this morning, uh, Gabriel was able to uh, share uh, from Matthew 3, 1 to 17. 
Um, so we are going to go. We're going to go through that, and as we're continuing our study on Matthew, um, so we're going to break this down into five uh, five sections. Uh, I don't want to say there are necessarily five points. Each section kind of has its own points, but uh, we're going to do five break this passage down in five different ways. So first, we're going to just look at who is John the Baptist. Next, we're going to look at repent. What does that mean to repent? Next, we're going to look at make ready the way. What does that mean to make ready the way? What was John the Baptist doing? Then we'll look at the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then finally, we'll look at why baptize Jesus. This passage kind of breaks down in those five areas pretty nicely. Uh, and then we'll have a little recap and we'll call it good. All right. So, oh yeah. First off, let me put my video back on before I get going too far. There we go. Um, all right, yeah, when I shared my screen, the video went off. There we go. So now we can see me and the slides. Beautiful. All right, so first off, let's go into who is John the Baptist. So Matthew 3, 1, and then 4 through 6. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. All right, so this is a pretty pretty vivid description of John the Baptist and who he was. Uh, we also know that he was a relative of Jesus through his mother, um, as Jesus' mom and John the Baptist's moms were related, and we did see that in Luke 1, 5 to 80. Um, so we know he's got that connection there. Uh, and then we know that he's, he's kind of a wild man. Uh, we know that he started his ministry in Judea here. So I love maps. Uh, anyone that has heard me speak before knows I love to put maps up for where things are. So you've got Israel here. You've got the Sea of Galilee up north. Uh, you've got the Dead Sea down south. So it was the wilderness of Judea. So where is that? That's this yellow box here that's just north of the Dead Sea, right along the Jordan River. The Jordan River connects those two bodies of water, which I think is always fascinating whenever I look at this. Um, and so John chose to do his ministry in the wilderness, this wilderness and right off the Jordan. And a lot of people, as I was researching and studying, it's like, why would he choose to do his ministry uh, in the wilderness? And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of symbolism there. So John would have been the first prophet of God in 400 years. God hadn't spoken 400 years, and we'll, we'll see how important that is here. And so he's the first one. And he wanted to be sim how use symbolism most likely of the wilderness where the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years before they had a fresh start or a rebirth, right? And so John started his ministry intentionally in the wilderness of Judea, most likely to symbolize that we're about to have a rebirth, a fresh start. God hadn't spoken. There wasn't a prophet. Um, and this was a way that he could potentially symbolize that is also uh, right in line with the Nazarite, uh, the Nazarite beliefs and um, in line with Elijah, who is another Nazarite. So probably the reason why he was um, starting his ministry in the wilderness outside of Judea there. So uh, where did he live? Um, well, there's a whole book on the cave of John the Baptist. And we can see here a potential cave that he was living out of. It's called the Suba Cave. It was announced in 2004. In the early 2000s, um, this cave was excavated and uh, for various reasons, there's some um, uh, some drawings on the wall of the cave that seem to indicate there was a man that lived there that had what appears to be like a camel skin um, cloth on and appears to be baptizing people. So, you know, not 100% sure this is the cave of John the Baptist, but there's some indicators. It's also a few miles away from where John the Baptist was born. Uh, and there's also a, a pool in the cave where you could have done baptisms with a bunch of clay pots. So, uh, Lots of interesting thing there. I love when the Bible comes alive with archaeology. And here's an example of, I mean, you, you think of a man living in the wilderness and you're like kind of where he lived. This kind of what I would imagine where he would live, honestly, this this cave, like a hole in the ground there, um, really stark. Uh, you could think of some Alaskans living in a similar situations. So yeah, he was a rough and wild situation there. Um, all right. And then we also see... Uh, this picture of him, I really like this picture because I think of John the Baptist almost like as a wild man, right? Living out in the wilderness in that cave that we just saw. And you kind of see him there with his hair crazy, big beard. See the camel skin, 
cloak and the leather belt. Um, and then you know that he wore a, uh, or that he ate a diet of locusts and honey, which is significant because that was allowed by the law of Moses. And so that would have been very permissible. Um, so then you see here the locusts, right? There are probably lots of locusts around. You see the, the kid there. I've got the kid of the picture in the picture catching a bunch of locusts and you can see the big blown up one. I was asking my kids last night when I did this, when we were going through this, like if they could imagine eating locusts dipped in honey as their primary sustenance. Um, I don't know if the kids out there would be too keen on eating locusts all day, every day. Uh, makes you grateful that you have moms preparing uh, food for you and not just having you eat locusts, I think. That locusts would have been plentiful um, and they were, and it was allowed for them to eat. And it says in Leviticus 11.22, these you may eat, the locusts in its kind and the devastating locusts in its kinds. Um, so it was a, a lawful thing for him to eat and it, it wouldn't have been that much of a surprise for people back in John the Baptist day for the Jews then. Uh, some people have said that he ate carob pods because um, the word could potentially be construed for that. But I think most modern historians think that he might have eaten carob pods as well as locusts, but most likely John the Baptist was eating locusts dipped in honey. Um, all right. So that's a brief overview of who John the Baptist was, where he came from, and like the start of his ministry. All right. So next, let's look at uh, Matthew 3.2 and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So this is the next block we want to look at, this repent, um, because the kingdom of heaven is coming near. Uh, and the word repent, it's tended to bring up like a curious variety of image in the minds of people. A lot of times we think of it as like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like we're crying and just like, oh, woe is me. I feel terrible. It's like kind of a feeling, at least that's how I know I've thought about it before doing this study. Um, if uh, this guy, if I pull this image up, he's actually crying as well. It's pretty funny, but it's like an emotional, it's an emotional impacted thing. Um, another thing we'll think about is with repentance is you need to offer something as a, a penance. You know, in Eagle River Grace, we don't have one of these. We don't have an altar we're not coming and making an offering for when we sin and make mistakes to repent, right? When we repent, um, we do it because it's a change of action, right? That's what it needs to be. So this is my aha moment going through here. It's like, aha, like what does repent actually mean? What was John the Baptist saying? So the Greek word that he was using is uh, metonia, metonia, and metonia means to think differently after, and it's a verb. It's actually an action word saying you're going to change your behavior and you're not just gonna feel really bad about it or offer a sacrifice as a repentance uh, for what you did. So repenting is actually having a change of your mind that takes us from unbelief to belief in what God says is true based on our actions. And so like this was really powerful for me because I think, uh, in my life, I see that all the time and with me and Caroline, where I'll, I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But then like, I'll keep doing the same thing. Like a classic thing in our lives right now is uh, calling for dinner. Like, and my kids will laugh about this, but she'll call me for dinner like, all right, dinner's ready. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I'll be right there. And like, I'll do like five things and be there five minutes later and I won't actually like go to dinner right away and then dinner's getting cold. And it's like, you know, just frustrating. Well. Then I'll go to dinner and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I just had this thing. I had to do it, whatever. Well, that's not actually changing. Like I'm repenting. I'm saying I'm sorry, but I'm not actually changing my behavior. And actually truly repenting would be I'm going to change my behavior and come to dinner on time. So, Caroline, that's my goal is to strive to actually come to dinner on time when you call. We'll report again in a few weeks, see how that's going. Um, so that's a big aha moment. And then why are they repenting here, right? Uh, they're repenting because of a belief in the kingdom of God is near uh, because John the Baptist, as we're about to see, is preparing the way for Jesus to come. Um, and the Jews used the term kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom. They were all synonyms. And there are some different interpretations of uh, when the kingdom's coming, how, etc. But for this purposes here, he's talking about Christ coming. Um, and he used these terms the same way the Jews would have been used to hearing these terms in the past. So they, they know what he's talking about. All right. So what next thing, what's he making the way ready for? Um, 
says, make ready the way, right? Matthew 3, 3, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So this was another thing I thought that was fascinating preparing for this. Um, the longstanding tradition in all the Middle East was super clear. Whenever an important dignitary, a king, a prince, whenever they would travel to a new place, they would literally have someone go on the road ahead of them. And I, you can see the picture here of the road that I have. They would literally go on the road ahead of them and clear the road. They would straighten it if they needed to. I've got a picture of that rock on the road. They would remove the little rocks. They would make it so the journey for the king or the prince was as smooth as possible, uh, which is kind of amazing that that was the tradition to do. Like that's a big time investment. And I can't imagine that being my job to walk a road and prepare for someone else just to travel down a road, right? But that's what they did. So when he said that, and when Isaiah said that, they would have been used to that. This was not something uncommon when prepare the way, like they were used to that tradition, the Jews. So they knew what he was saying. And they would literally sometimes straighten the road. Like if the road was too windy, they would straighten it for the king, uh, which is just amazing to think about. Um, and so that's what John was doing. And so we see here in Isaiah 43, the verse that uh, Matthew is citing, uh, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. So prophecy coming true, being fulfilled. Again, another way that the Bible just blows my mind with how much, um, how connected it is. And just, it seems like impossible not to be true. And then Another little interesting thing is that's Isaiah 40, right? Matthew is the Bible's 40th book. So interesting parallels there. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and there's a lot of parallels between the 66 chapters in Isaiah and the 66 books of the Bible. Um, so this is what John the Baptist does for Jesus. Morally and spiritually, he prepares the way for, uh, for Jesus's arrival. He's making the path clear and clean. He's making it straight, um, and he's literally... Uh, preparing this path for Jesus, the son of David, to come and start his ministry, which is pretty huge. And the Jews, this would have really resonated with them in this imagery, right? Um, okay, so I wanted to think through some takeaways on this because uh, it was, again, another thing that kind of impacted me. So how can we make ready the way in our lives? Uh, a lot of times in Icon with the young men, we talk about this, like, how do you make ready your life so that you're going to live and make good choices later on? Uh, how are you going to make put yourself in a better situation so you use your time wisely? So I had that thought with this application. You know, if you, John the Baptist was doing everything he could to prepare for Christ's arrival, like how do we do that in our lives now? Um, and then next, what can we do for those around us? Uh, to prepare for their arrival. And this is, I thought of, my wife is an incredible hostess. She loves hosting people. So um, like, how can we look for ways to love people around us instead of looking at ourselves? Like, what are those little things we can look at um, in people's lives that they, that they really enjoy? Um, like, for example, uh, Caroline, when we have people come over, uh, she knows which people like peanut M&Ms and which people like chocolate M&Ms. And she makes sure that the right M&Ms are prepared for them when they arrive. Like, to me, that's pretty cool. And it's like, how, how can we love people more by doing little things like that? And then lastly, uh, how can we help others see the truth of the scripture, right? Because again, this, is, this simple passage here shows a lot of truth of the scripture. Um, and we might, as we're preparing the path for people, we might not see the fruit, but we could plant the seed. Um, and so just be thinking of ways that we could do that as we're, as we see how John made the way ready for Jesus. Um, all right, so next, transition to our next one, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And this is talked about in Matthew 3, 7 to 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, so uh, you read this and you're like, 
Wow, that's powerful. Uh, I'm glad I don't get talked to very often that way because that would probably make me cry. Uh, that's pretty brutal if you're approaching someone he's he's calling you out like in that bold of terms, right? Um, and this is the first time we see the Pharisees and Sadducees in the New Testament. The Pharisees were the righteous ones and the Sadducees were the separate ones. Uh, but they were the leaders of the Jewish, the Jews at this time. Like they, they were the two main Jewish groups. Uh, they didn't have the same viewpoints, but they had the, that grip on the control of how Judaism was practiced. So for him to call them out like this in such powerful words uh, is incredible. Um, so the Pharisees, uh, they had a, they believed in all the Old Testament, but they really liked to add to it and make their own rules. I was joking with my kids. It sounds familiar, like some kids I know like to adjust the rules for their benefit, right? Um, but all of us, I like to do that too. Uh, and then the Sadducees, they claimed to believe in the five books, but they, they didn't believe in any of the, like, like the miracles, the angels. They were skeptical of a lot of that stuff. Um, and they just, they called all that into question. So they were kind of like, Maybe, maybe like some of our overly scientific people of today, I don't know. Uh, but at the end of the day, both of them were hypocrites. Both groups were not practicing what they were preaching. They were saying these things, but they weren't living it out. And John, like he immediately and openly calls them out about it in like these graphic and negative terms. Um, by calling them a brood of vipers, uh, This uh, that's what the Bible um, typically calls people that really are performing poorly because uh, not only are they uh, poisonous creatures that are kind of just nasty poisonous things they're also unclean by the law so to call them vipers was calling them you're like venomous you're unclean like you are not living life the way you should be and the way you say you are um, so he said he openly calls him out about this and says just because you you basically think you can get away with everything like you think because you were descended from abraham that you're good to go and you're going to get into heaven and john says uh no that's not true and he compares them to the rocks and he says which again is incredible uh he's saying god could take these rocks and they could go into heaven easier than you could like that just because you're descendants of Abraham doesn't mean that you're getting into heaven. Um, and this was a shocking piece of news for the Jews. Like, cause that, to this point, they thought that they were good to go no matter what. Um, but this was, this was John saying, no, you're, you're not, you have to repent back to that. You have to change your behavior and actually live, um, in accordance with the law. And then the law is about to change with Christ coming in this kingdom that's coming. Um, an entry into this kingdom is not to be assumed based on your ancestry. So huge adjustment in their thinking there. Um, he then goes on to say, to talk about uh, the trees bearing fruit. And this symbolism we see throughout the Bible, we see it in the Old Testament in Psalm 1, 1 to 3, in Psalm 92, 12 to 14, talking just about um, trees bearing fruit. Uh, we see it in the New Testament where uh, we were supposed to be the vine, you know, Christ says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Anyone that doesn't bear fruit will be cut off. Um, so this symbolism of fruit, trees bearing fruit is very powerful uh, and important. And as I thought about this message, again, you gotta go back to your family and like things you know. And I was reminded just, I, we have these plants, yeah, it's kind of convenient that I'm here giving this, I guess, because we have these plants in my room that you can see behind me. And uh, Caroline loves these plants. She takes care of them. And whenever the plants are blooming or producing new fruit, like I get ecstatic texts. I think it's the most exciting thing in her life when a, uh, a new leaf pops up. But that, that's the way, what plants were designed to do. They're designed to bear fruit and to grow. Um, and if they're not, then the plants are dead and they're cut down and removed, right? If the plants stop bearing fruit, then Caroline gets rid of them. Because why would you keep a a plant that's not bearing fruit, right? Um, and so this imagery is is good. It's like, okay, I see this now. Like I need to be bearing fruit in my life. The Pharisees and Sadducees were not bearing fruit in their life. And this was ad addressed in Deuteronomy 2020 in the law too. It, it allowed that trees that weren't bearing fruit could be cut down. Like, so the Pharisees would have known this and they would know like, ooh, 
he's kind of got us here. We're actually not bearing fruit. We're not doing what we say we're doing. Um, we got a problem here. The, and the law does say we could be cut down if we're not bearing fruit. So it, it causes us to think in our own lives, like, where am I bearing fruit? Like, how am I living my life in such a way that I am producing new leaves, new growth, uh, and not just like muddling around, dying, and just staying stagnant, right? Uh, so uh, moving on here. So what is uh, what does John say? And this is a little transition verses here, preparing for why he was baptizing Jesus, which is our final final point here. So. Matthew 3, 11 to 12, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Uh, so here again, we have powerful imagery coming from, from John. Uh, and he's saying, I'm baptizing with water for repentance. Um, but after me is come, someone who's going to baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. Um, and I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. And uh, carrying sandals was usually reserved for the lowest of the low people, which you can imagine. Uh, even in today's society, carrying someone's shoes is not, it's not something we even really think about. Um, but yeah, in those days the the jews uh their culture was the lowest member of the household is the one who would carry the sandals so he's saying i'm i'm not even worth doing that and so again the jews would recognize this imagery of like wow okay he's saying he's so low he can't even touch his sandals which is the, already the lowest person in the household um so john here is pointing to two things he's pointing to jesus who's coming soon but then he's also cut pointing to jesus who's coming later so in Jesus who's coming sooner uh, is the Lamb of God. He's going to uh, lift up our sins in John 1, 29 and 36. But then when Jesus comes later, it's his second coming. That's the judgment or the winnowing when he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? And here I always wondered what a winnowing fork looks like. So we've got the winnowing fork um, and you can see the guy there um, throwing it up into the air to separate the wheat from the chaff. So pretty effective tool um, and you always need the right tool for the job and you can see how uh, that happening and then the chaff is they, they separate it so the chaff can get burned up so seeing that visual imagery um, you see what John's saying here is uh, is not not something I would necessarily want to participate in on the wrong side all right so then it's like okay well now why baptize Jesus so we got in Matthew 3 13 to 17 then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Okay, I gotta stop right there because this is just so cool to me, this, this part of the message, uh, that it's been 400 years since we've had a prophet of God, right? 400 years that we know of, um, and this is the first thing God says or speaks uh, to anyone directly in that 400 years right is this is my son whom i'm loved with him i am well pleased uh, and of course we had some angels come and some other some other people to this point but this is the first time god speaks again um in that 400 year gap between the prophets uh and now john is filling that right and then jesus gets baptized and then when afterwards this is what god says right uh so pretty amazing um and so john said he baptized now going back to like why baptize Jesus, right? Because John said he baptized as a baptism of repentance. Like we just saw that in 11 to 12. So when people came to John, they weren't, they weren't saying they were righteous or anything. They were confessing their sins and then they were repenting, which what's repenting? It's they're saying they're, they're wrong and they're actually going to change their behavior, which is that key point we want to foot stomp. Uh, so they came to 
to John to be baptized as that sign of repentance. Like this is a visual sign that I'm changing my behavior. Well, why would Jesus come to John to be baptized? Because he didn't need to change his behavior. He was already perfect and he didn't need to repent, right? So he wasn't confessing his sins, but Christ asked John to baptize him just as this picture of his total agreement with John's message. Like this is him symbolizing that what John is saying is fully true, that we do need to change our behavior. The kingdom of God is at hand and those who believe in Christ are going to be saved. And Jesus is being baptized to identify himself in John's message. And then this shows, it visualizes that Christ is spiritually clean, obviously with what happens afterwards. So just truly amazing. So after he's baptized, we see in that one passage, the presence of all the whole three Trinity in one, we see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all coming on him. And we see a contrast too, because Christ is going to baptize with fire, and yet God sent a dove down symbolizing the Holy Spirit, which and also symbolizes uh, peace, um, unlike the fire that Christ is going to be baptizing with. So pretty, pretty neat uh, and pretty amazing moment here. Um, so we see the total approval of God the Father toward God the Son in this moment. Um, and it reflects what God says in Isaiah 42, 1. Again, another amazing parallel of scripture uh, coming true. And it says, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So again, uh, just prophecy being fulfilled uh, left and right here. All right. So I think that kind of brings us to the end there. Hopefully uh, uh, this this was uh, impactful. And I know I know for me, as, as it often is when you're preparing a message and doing all the study, there's so much more I want to talk about and say. And I know this um, really impacted me in, in amazing ways, being able to go through this and learn from this. So like I said, we'll check in in a few weeks, see if I can actually change some of my behavior and truly repent. Um, but let's kind of just a quick review of what we went through. So who is John the Baptist? Like I said, he's kind of a wild man living out in the wilderness, but very symbolic and intentional what he's doing and in accordance with the law, right? Um, then we talked about repentance and how his message of repenting and how that's an action and not an emotion. And too often we want to live our lives where we just show that we're sorry and remorse is a good thing. We should be sorry and remorseful. Uh, but what's more important is that we actually change our action in, in line with that remorse. Uh, next, we talked about make ready the way and what does that look like? Um, and just the, the tradition in the Middle East, the, all throughout the Middle East of sending someone ahead of a prince or a king to make the path straight and literally change the road for that person. Um, and so John was that, that person for Jesus. How can we be that person for those around us? Um, how can we plant seeds? How can we look for ways to love others that are coming? Uh, next, we looked at the Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, and we looked at Jesus is for us all. Um, don't be a hypocrite <laughs> and bear fruit. A, a lot of things there that the Pharisees, sometimes you learn the most when you look at people who are living their lives the wrong way. And I think that's an example, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees living their lives, not how we want to live our lives. And then lastly, uh, why baptize Jesus? Because Christ is fulfilling the prophecy and Christ is showing his full agreement in the message of John the Baptist. So yeah, wow, great, great passage of scripture to talk on today. Um, love being able to spend time with you guys this morning. Praise the Lord for technology. I'm glad I was able to speak with you and uh, do that um, using technology. So let me just close this in prayer. And uh, just again, thank you so much for your time. And hopefully uh, this was uh, meaningful and we're able, able to move forward and live our life more for, for Christ. So uh, dear Lord, uh, thank you so much for your word. It's just your word is so powerful in so many ways. And um, it really is the sword. Um, it's so cool to see all the different connections throughout scripture um, and to see just the nuances and uh, and just how how much you love us, God, through your word and how much you're showing us your truth through your word. It's truly uh, amazing. And we're so thankful for that. Uh, pray that we'll uh, be able to live out these truths in our lives daily, um, even though it's such a struggle and that we will be able to live for you and build your kingdom here on earth. In your precious name. Amen. All right, let's worship.
the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Have a great week.